year five. Today it's my turn to do some reading for you from Cosmic. See how things are going for Liam. Quest Orange. In World of Warcraft, the quests are all colour coded. Grey quests involve defeating people with fewer skills than yourselves. They're very easy, but you don't gain much experience. Then there are yellow, a bit harder, orange, a lot harder, and red, certain death. I decided the best thing was to treat this whole thing as a quest. Dr Drax definitely gave us the impression that she was sending us on a grey quest. Maybe a bit yellow around the edges, but definitely not orange, and certainly not certain death. For a start, we had loads of backup. She took us to Drax Control so that we could see for ourselves. It's a massive glass office with huge plants and a little water feature and dozens of people strolling around in white shirts, talking into headsets, reading their blackberries. They certainly looked like they knew what they were doing. These are the clever people who will be steering your rocket, Dr Drax said. So you won't have to do a thing. The infinite possibility really is just a ride. And Drax Control is like the man in the fairground booth. All you've got to do is be sensible and enjoy the view for a few hours. Oh, and do one simple little thing for me. And it did seem a very simple little thing. We had to press some colour-coded buttons in the right order at the right time. That was it. Because the infinite possibility is really a launch vehicle. That's why it's so big. It was carrying something into space. A payload. A completely cosmic payload. I'll explain it all to you, said Dr Drax. It's a kind of space minibus. <clears throat> I designed it myself. It's called the Dandelion because it doesn't have engines, just these big silvery sails that catch the solar wind, just like normal sails catch the normal wind and blow it across space. <clears throat> a spaceship propelled by sunbeams, as quiet and traceless as a dandelion seed. Hence the name. She showed us a model. It looked like a high-sided vehicle with lots of windows, like an ice cream van only with no wheels and no ice cream man. Once it was separated from the infinite possibility, the people at Drax Control were going to steer the ice cream van across space, round the back of the moon and back to Earth by remote control. Then it was going to do a lap of the Earth and head back around the moon, and it was going to keep doing that, one lap of the Earth, one lap of the moon, in a kind of figure of eight forever. It had comfortable seats that turned into beds. Dr Drax's plan was as to, that as soon as Infinity Park was opened, people would pay to get into a small rocket, dock with the dandelion during its Earth orbit and stay on one for one lap of the moon before, before going back down to Earth. A sightseeing trip around the moon in an interplanetary ice cream van. The dandelion was kind of a massive box just under the living quarters of the infinite possibility. All we had to do was shoot up into space, float around for a bit, and then, when Dr Drax said so, press the buttons in the right order, red, orange, green, and that would blow the dandelion off into its own orbit. Then Drax Control would bring us back home in the command module. The buttons are designed to set off a series of small explosive charges. Red, to separate the dandelion from the rocket, orange, to blow the covers off the dandelion, and green, to make its sails pop out. We could detonate the charges from the ground, said Dr Drax, but we thought it best to keep it simple. What could go wrong? Well, nothing did go wrong exactly. Not with the buttons. Not with the charges. Not with the dandelion. The thing that went wrong was us. The next chapter is called Launch Minus 48. Countdown begins 48 hours before liftoff. For the last 48 hours, we had to stay in the crew quarters and not talk to anyone from outside. It was supposed to be a bonding experience. Also, all the food in the fridge and the cupboards was replaced with space food. Little packs with straw sticking out of them. A bit like Capri Sun, but with meat and veg instead of orange juice. We were supposed to eat space food from now on so that we'd get used to it. The packs had some worrying names, for instance, saliva, chicken, and pork that makes you eat your own hand. Samson too said it was probably a problem with the translation. Maybe saliva chicken means mouth-watering chicken, he said, and perhaps <coughs> pork that makes you eat your own hand is just finger-licking good. Maybe, said Florida, but I think I'll stick to ice cream. Me too, said everyone else. So we just sat there sucking on ice cream with two flavours, raspberry like a breeze on a lake or banana divided, and practised the colour code button pressing on the computers. 
During the night, there was a clanging sound, like the lid had fallen off the sky or something. Everyone ran into the living room. When I got there, they were all huddled together. I was going to get into the huddle too when Samson too said, what is it? And I realised they were all waiting for me to sort it out. Hassan said, is it bears? Bears? Why would it be bears? Wait here and I'll go and look. I opened the front door thinking, what if it is bears? I couldn't see any or smell anything. I could hear a noise though, a slow, monotonous rumble, but I couldn't see anything except the possibility building. Then I realised the building had changed shape. I stood and watched for a while before understanding what was going on. They were moving the rocket, very, very slowly. It was trundling out on its tracks, out in the desert, about three miles away. It was moving along the rails to the launch site. You could barely see anything happening, but if you looked away and looked back, you could see a bit more of the rocket had shouldered out of the building. It was like watching the minute hand on the clock. The others all crowded around me and said, come on, let's get some sleep, it's just the rocket. Nothing to be scared of. I was thinking, that is so much scarier than the bears. I want my dad, said Samson too. I knew just how he felt. Next morning, there was a pile of presents waiting for us on the dining table. Some rubbery, pencil casey type things called personal in-flight packs and five of the latest Draxcom games console. They're called wrist stations. We'd had a visit from Space Santa. Wrist stations are quietly cosmic, by the way. They're basically Game Boys that fit on your wrist, but instead of having some squinty little screen, they project the game onto the wall, like in the cinema, so you can have it as big as you like. They all came lo loaded with Orbiter 4, Stone Age Boneheads and Surfing Eskimos, except mine, which had Professional Golfer and Testosterone Cholesterol Kit. There was a note from Dr Drax explaining that we could pack whatever we wanted in the personal in-flight packs, PIPs for short, to take us personal luggage on the trip. We could take anything we like, as long as it fitted in the pip. Two minutes later, there was a wrist station territorial dispute. Hassan and Max were playing Orbiter 4 together on one wall, and Samson 2 was using another wall to play Stone Age Boneheads, so there was nowhere for Florida to play. I started by suggesting that Florida and Samson 2 played Boneheads together, using the two-player option, but that suggestion led to immediate off-screen violence. In the end, I told Samson 2 to stand nearer the wall to make the projection smaller. He said, no. Everyone stared at me. It was a test of dadness. What was I supposed to do? Beg him? Threaten him? Shove him? If I couldn't control them here in the living room, what would it be like in orbit? I moved the couch into the centre of the room. I checked that it was lined up with the middle of the wall. Then without even looking at him, I said, Samson 2, sit down here. And that's all I said. I did try to make it sound like it. I expected immediate obedience. Then I held my breath. Samson, too, didn't look away from the wall, but he didn't say anything. But he did move forward and around the couch. Then he sat down and carried on playing. His game had shrunk to half size now and there was loads of room for Florida to play. I said, now move right to that end, Samson, and Florida, you sit at this end, which they both did. Hassan and Max weren't even looking at me now. I'd passed the test. But what if Samson, too, had just carried on saying no? I decided then and there to pack Talk to Your Team in my pip. It was really too big. I had to squeeze it in bit by bit. And as I was nudging the rubber sides over the book's spine, I noticed all the dad things on it. The two overlapping tea stains, like a figure eight, the phone number written in biro, the petrol receipts. It was my dad's book. My dad. I wished he'd turn up now, like he did when I'd got into that Porsche. I wished he'd turn up and shout, stop. There we go. That's my two chapters for you. We have to say thank you to Macmillan for letting us read this book to them. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoy the next few chapters too. It's bye from me and it's bye from Bob behind me. Take care. Bye.